Right, I'm going to um, admit people now. I've started recording. Good evening, everyone. We're just going to wait a few minutes while the, the room fills with people uh, who are joining. So it will be starting in just 60 seconds or so. Okay, I think we're going to begin now. Um, although I can see there are just a few more people coming in, so I'll give it another 15 seconds or so. All right, we're, we're working to quite a tight schedule this evening, so I think I'm going to begin. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Toby Simpson. I'm the director of the Vino Holocaust Library. Welcome to tonight's event, which is an online conversation on racial anti-Semitism. And we're holding this event tonight in partnership with the Pears Institute for the Study of Anti-Semitism at, at Birkbeck College. This event is the third in a series of uh, online events organized by the Vino Holocaust Library on the subjects of racism, colonialism, anti-Semitism, and genocide. The series began in July with a discussion on race science, eugenics in historical and contemporary context with Angela Saini, Joe Mulhall, and Marius Turder. It continued in September with an event entitled Genocide Concepts and Problems, in which we had a fascinating discussion between Dirk Moses and Becky Jinks. Our speakers this evening, who will help us deepen our understanding of the origins, development, and the contemporary significance of racial antisemitism, are Professor David Feldman, Director of the Pears Institute, and Professor Stephanie Springorum, Director of the Centre for Research on Antisemitism at the Technical University Berlin. Before starting the event this evening, I have just a few housekeeping points. Uh, the first of these is that our auto captioning is available. And if you want to switch that on, there should be an option at the bottom of your screen um, for anyone who would like to see subtitles. Um, I should also say that the event is scheduled to last around an hour, uh, but we do want to enable people to ask questions via the chat. So I will be monitoring questions as the discussion develops. Um, and uh, we will have a section at the end of the event where those can be posed to Professor Feldman and Professor Shula Springorum. Um, we will be recording the event and it will be posted to YouTube tomorrow. And on the Vina Holocaust Library's YouTube page, you can find recordings of this event and the previous two events in the series if you missed those. And any of you who were able to join us at the previous events will know uh, that what we're doing is we're inviting our speakers to explore connections between modern day racism and anti-Semitism and genocide in the 20th and 21st century, and also uh, European colonial projects, and in particular, colonial violence. Uh, 
This series was inspired by the intensification of engagement with issues of racism and also the legacy of colonial violence this year in, wake, uh, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. These events prompted us to reflect on the fact that in the late 19th century especially, pseudoscientific ideas about the supposed superiority or inferiority of races in inverted commas provided an impetus for European colonialism and also for anti-Semitism and anti-Gypsy prejudice. In the 20th century, outbreaks of genocidal violence and the Holocaust were shaped by these long-standing trends in a number of important ways. In the 21st century, anti-Semitic conspiracies have gained new life through online dissemination as have other forms of racism. So understanding and reflecting upon the historical roots and antecedents of these developments and also the calamitous results that they can produce is of critical importance. The Wiener Holocaust Library's collections offer crucial insights into uh, these, this history. And for example, the collection item that you can see uh, on the slide, which we chose to illustrate this event, uh, is, is one of the items in our collection that's, that's pertinent to tonight's discussion. It's a page of schoolwork from a young German girl uh, called Gerda Narber. In her homework, she was asked to explain the classification of Jews versus Germans, as if those somehow opposed, uh, as part of the ex explanation of the Nuremberg laws that had recently been introduced in Germany. Uh, the homework was clearly intended to indoctrinate Gerda and her classmates with the false idea that uh, somehow Nazi ideology and anti-Semitism had a rational basis in what, what was often referred to at the time as race science or racial hygiene. So to help us understand how such a document could be thinkable uh, in a society which ultimately existed not long ago and not far away, I couldn't imagine two better qualified speakers than the two we have with us this evening. Professor David Feldman is the director of the Pears Institute for the Study of Antisemitism at Birkbeck College, University of London, where he's also professor of history. His publications include Englishmen and Jews, Social Relations and Political Culture, 1840 to 1914, and most recently, Boycotts Past and Present from the American Revolution to the Boycott of Israel. His writing on contemporary antisemitism has appeared in The Guardian, The Financial Times, Haaretz, History Workshop Online, the Independent and the Political Quarterly. Professor Stephanie Shula Springorum has been the Director of the Centre for Research on Antisemitism since 2011 and uh, Co-Director of the Selma Stern Centre for Jewish Studies since 2012, both based in Berlin. In 2020, she became the Director of the Berlin branch of the Centre for Research on Social Cohesion. Her fields of research include Jewish, German and Spanish history, and her recent publications are four years after Antisemitism and Racism in Trump's America, Gender and Politics of Antisemitism, published in the American Historical Review, and Perspectives in German Jewish History, Gender and Difference, uh, published by Paderborn in 2014. So I'd like to welcome both of our speakers. So I'd like to start the uh, conversation by asking uh, Professor Feldman, if I may, David, in order to get a broad overview of a subject like racial antisemitism, we're of course dealing with a complex phenomenon with a very long history. And so I wonder if you wouldn't mind starting us off with your thoughts on the origins of racial antisemitism. Um, is it right to see earlier forms which lacked the pseudoscientific aspects, such as, for example, medieval antisemitism, as something very different? Um, Thank you, Toby, um, and thank you for the invitation to speak, I suppose, because it's co-hosted by the Pears Institute, I should thank myself as well for the invitation <laughs> yes. to speak this evening. Um, one way of approaching your question is to remind ourselves that in the historiography of anti-Semitism, there's perhaps the traditional historiography, there's a division which is often made between religious anti-Semitism, old Christian anti-Judaism, and new racial anti-Semitism, um, which um, emerged, uh, so we're told, and in, some, in many ways did emerge in the late 19th century. There's been a lot of work though in, I think in recent years, which has questioned this categorical division. One, uh, there are two ways of trying to explore this. One is, if you like, empirically, the other is conceptually. Empirically, uh, 
if we think about medieval anti-Semitism, yes, it was rooted in, um, in Christian anti-Judaism, in the idea that Jews had rejected the Messiah, Jews had missed the turning in history. But the particular Christian critique of Judaism was that at a religious level, Jews were not spiritual. They were a rule bound a religion, unlike Christianity. And that very easily became a criticism of Jews and Judaism as materialist. And certainly in the 11th century, as the as a European, as the economy in Europe recovered from the stagnation of the early Middle Ages, as trade flowed, as credit flowed, clerics and moralists wanted to remind people um, of their moral and Christian obligations. And one way in which they did so was to accuse them in the memorable words of Sarah Lipton at a, at a lecture she gave at the Pears Institute in the Jewish Museum, clerics and scholars accused non-Jews when they were lending money of being Jewy, as it were. So the accusation of being Jewish was tied up. It went from being a theological critique of materialism and legalism to a criticism of everyday behavior. And so, it, so, so religious anti-Semitism was not only religious anti-Semitism. And here, if you like, we can move to the concept to a different conceptualization of it, to think of it as a process of racialization. So um, in other words, to ascribing social or cultural or political characteristics to an ethnic group or to, um, or to um, a religious group. Because race, although there are myriad biological differences between human populations, different skin color, different hair color, different blood group, um, at different compositions of DNA. Um, calling those a race is something which humans impose on that material. It's a category that we impose on that material. And then secondly, there's a second step, which is to give that those biological markers social or cultural or political significance. And so giving social, cultural and political significance to the particularities of the Jewish population was something that was going on in the Middle Ages and in the early modern period. And in that sense moved beyond religious antisemitism and became something that we can call racialization. Thank you, David. Um, turning over uh, to, to uh, Stephanie, I wonder um, whether you have any thoughts on, on what the meaning is of, of kind of the idea of a modern racial anti-Semitism. Um, well, first of all, let me thank the conveners, Toby and David, for inviting me. And um, I must warn the audience, I think we will not have a controversial discussion because David and I um, know each other quite well and kind of um, yeah, discuss our points very often. So before I answer your question, Toby, I would like to point out to one, another, I think important factor of pre-modern times, which links up, which then we would call modern anti-Semitism. And that's the topic that I've been working on in the last years, which um, regards Spain. And um, I think what David just pointed out, this slow process of racialization, even the middle ages, was of course, um, I think, had one basis in, as he said, in day-to-day -day life and practices and economic be, economic um, opportunities, etc., and also in theology. I think what developed in the Middle Ages, in especially in the 12th and 13th century, is this link of it's not only that uh, you know that stubborn Jews did not accept Jesus as a Messiah but also that they killed the son of God. I mean, they, they killed, you know, in the Christian imagination. So what you have here is like this link between 
the Jews and evil or the utmost evil or even the devil or what, you know, this. Oh, Stephanie, we seem to have lost your audio. Is anyone? I just okay. wonder, there we go, we can hear you again. Okay, so I wanted just to point out that there's also this image of um, Jews being connected to the evil. And I'm pointing this out because I, was, I will come back to this when we talk about modern anti-Semitism and conspiracy theory, et cetera, et cetera. And then, so the work, what I'm working on Spain, I think is an important step in, in where we are getting at from modern racial anti-Semitism, because as you all know, in the pressure on, on, on the Jewish groups all over Europe became more and more tough in the 14th and 15th century and led to uh, violence and uh, to forced baptism. So suddenly, and especially in Spain, you so suddenly had a far bigger group than usual of Jews who were baptized or who chose baptism under pressure. And so Christianity had to deal with them. And before that, I mean, once, and this is what we still learn in school about Christian anti-Judaism, that it's only related to religion. And once people were baptized, the problem, problem was solved. But Spain then, when it, the number became greater, Spain shows the image, uh, the, the example of Spain can show that, you know, that's where racialization, be, you know, took another turn in the sense that you had a huge amount of Christians of Jewish, but also of Muslim background who were Christians, but who were still treated differently. And uh, in order to do this, they, you know, certain like uh, monasteries, but also state um, institutions um, installed what they called the blood purity laws, which prevented Christians from Jewish background and later on from an imagined Jewish background to, to gain access to certain state institution and to power basically to the church to the state to the military and at the same time and i think this is also important you know for my argument um people who were persecuted and convicted or killed as heretics to be by the famous inquisition throughout the following centuries where basically heresy was um found you know, by looking for Jewish background, you know, if this was only imagined or, or not, doesn't matter here. The, the fact is that throughout some centuries in, in, it's not all over Europe, but especially in Spain, but also in Italy, Portugal, Christians were openly and, and brutally killed because, you know, and they, they were like, they were, how do you say this? They were convicted by the stain of their wrong blood. So I think this is not only ideology wise, but also in, in a certain day, not in a day to day practice, but in a practice that was seen by people. They could go and see those um, auto da fe, those famous ones, but they could also read um, descriptions of this and see pictures of, not pictures, but drawings of this, as we all know, which were distributed all over Europe. Mm. And so it's not surprisingly that then, when you come, but this is, you can say this is Spain and it's far away, et cetera, but this, you know, had a big influence on, on, the, on, uh, on Luther and the Protestant theologians. And there you can find it, you know, in abundance, his hatred and his viciousness, not only towards Jews, which is well known, but especially against baptized Jews who mm. are pretending to pre-Christians, who are false. So we have all these, what we still have today, this idea of Jews being false, pretending to be something which they are not in order to gain whatever advantages. So I think all this leads up to all this, what we have described here leads up to what then we call, or some people call modern or racial anti-Semitism. That's absolutely fascinating. I, and I, I think uh, it's interesting to, to think about Spain as well, because uh, one of the aspects we're looking at in this series, of, of course, is the legacy of colonialism. And uh, in 16th century Spain, of course, you have really the beginnings of a, a global empire uh, for the first time in the, under the Habsburgs. So again, turning back to David, just to keep the, the dynamic going, I, um, uh, David, do you have any thoughts about the possible linkages between um, the development of racial anti-Semitism and imperial rivalries uh, in Europe? Um, I think that empire had a lot 
to do with the origins of modern racial theory, but and particularly as it affected Jews, but perhaps not quite in the way, or not immediately in the way that you described. Um, I think what was crucial here is the emergence of the concept of the Aryan, Aryan theory. And that was related, very closely related to British rule in India. Um, and British rule in India produced a fascination with Sanskrit um, and produced several generations of Orientalist scholars, not least in Germany, but actually the most famous, the most eminent one in Britain was a German who naturalized as a British subject in 1856 and spent his working life in Oxford University. Um, his name was Friedrich Max Muller, who is barely remembered today, but was really the first sort of media don superstar in history. Um, he, was a, he was a major, major figure in Victorian culture, and he was the major theorist of the concept of the Aryan. He devoted his life, the major part of his life, to translating into English um, Hindu, uh, Hindu texts. But the, in a nutshell, his theory was that cultures were determined by the structures of their languages. And he identified, along with other scholars of the time, different language families, of which there were three. Turanian, which we don't have to think about, Aryan, and Semitic. And the structures of these languages produced, predicted, determined the sorts of thoughts that each language family was capable of producing. So Semites, according to Muller, but not only Muller, others since in France, such as Ernest Renan, thought that Semites, their only contribution to civilization and culture was monotheism. Actually, Muller doubted even that. Um, whereas Aryans were, were, were philosophical, um, creative, um, were able to make political states, write great poetry, and all the rest of this. Now, the Aryans migrated out of Asia into Europe and intersect with the history of Christianity, as far as Muller and these other people are concerned, um, because it's important to understand that these early racial theorists were also committed Christians. So Jesus was a Semite, but it was only by Paul taking early Christianity to Aryan peoples that it was able to fully develop and it spread up through Europe, through the European, uh, through the Roman Empire, eventually taken over by the, Teuton, by the Teutonic peoples to whom the future of the world and of Christianity belonged. And England as an Anglo-Saxon nation belonged to the Teutonic peoples, according to this theory. So what we have here is a mixture of the legacy of colonialism, um, an attempt to modernize, uh, to modernize Christianity so that it would be more in line, um, uh, more accommodating to what people knew then knew about um, other religions, the history, the the history of, of the world, the uh, the um, problems with biblical chronology, and um, and the new technical science of comparative philology, and this was the mix out of which modern racial theory came in Germany and in Britain in the middle of the 19th century. Thank you, David. Um, that's, that's a really fascinating um, uh, exploration of, of, of the, the relationship between empire and, and racial antisemitism. Um, 
Stephanie, I wonder if you might want to be able to comment also on the perspective from outside of Britain and also maybe the perspective from um, from, from many of the early theorists uh, uh, race, uh, of racial antisemitism uh, who were in some way fundamentally opposed to, to the British Empire um, and uh, who, who saw it as, a, as a, some kind of existential threat. Well, just one short remark to the, from, back to the Spanish Empire, which, as you said, of course, was, you know, fundamental in exporting the idea of that people are you know racially different and this can be like you know seen by their bloodline and and then they take this idea over to to latin america and we have some people some of you in the audience might know these images you have and of, they were fascinated by mixture so that is i think one of the basic idea of racism in general is to avoid mixtures because mixture you know, brings the whole system and, you know, it puts the whole system in danger. So we have this, you know, in Latin America, and, and this goes on until the 19th century. And just, uh, I forgot to say this in my last remark, I mean, these blood purity laws were, you know, were abolished only in the 19th century. And in some churches, they were still, you know, they were on in, until the 20th century, but this is just in parentheses. So I would like, but I would like to point out one thing that links up um, that goes a little bit back from the empire, but I think we should talk about what happened around 1800, because this is for me much, maybe an even more important turning point. And you might notice that I don't distinguish so sharply between, I mean, all my work is directed against, you know, the strict difference of pre-modern Christian anti-Judaism and racial modern anti-Semitism. I think it's much more mixed. And another argument would be to look at the moment around 1800, uh, you know, ar around the enlightenment when something new happened. And this is the idea of that all humans are equal. And suddenly we have this idea of equality, you know, in the air. And so, at, but at the same time, certain groups of people were, ex were excluded. So you had to, you know, get some legitimation for this, which would not be religious, you know, which would not be, you know, the one that Christianity would offer being Christian or non-Christian. So suddenly you had to, to do, you know, to explain why the inhabitants of the colonies, but also Jews in Europe, but also women were not part of this equality project. And, uh, and I think here, and you know, I can only speak about Germany. Um, I think we have around 1800, you have all kinds of discussions of whether Jews are already fit to become full equal citizens. So the idea of becoming a citizen is suddenly bound up with certain qualities that you have to have. And one, like the liberal idea would be that yes, if they, you know, get these qualities, then they can be citizens. It's, kind of uh, enlightened education project that starts with emancipation and it starts in Germany and in, in other countries and, and the other and the other position and this is the counter enlightenment position would be no they can never be citizens you know because it's it's about essence and it's not about education and I think this is the two opposing forces to be very pathetic that we still are fighting with in a way you know um, with this post postulate of equality and uh, human rights on the one hand, and those who look for arguments for hierarchy, to put it very general. Um, if you. I could just say at that point, Toby, I think that this is an interesting point at which what Stephanie has been talking about um, touches on the themes um, over colonialism that you were talking about before. So, one of the very important points of stimulus to racial thought broadly in the 19th century was the per perceived failure of projects promoting equality. So um, when, for example, um, the enslaved population of Jamaica was sort of slowly freed 
from slavery by stages through the 1830s um, for reasons which made perfect sense to them, they actually retreated from the labor market, confounding the, uh, 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 they much preferred to, um, to cultivate for themselves on small, uh, on small, uh, on small plots of land. Um, this obviously produced a crisis or deepened the crisis for the sugar producers in Jamaica, and it generated racial theories to exp in other words, the racial character of the freed slaves was invoked as an explanation for why the hopes that, that, that the colonial powers had invested in emancipation were not coming to fruition. Mm. And one of the great exponents of this, one of the most terrible exponents of this was the Scottish essayist, moralist, polemicist, um, Thomas Carlyle, who also was one of the most prominent figures in the middle of the 19th century in Britain, um, who was involved in racializing Jews as well. Mm. But, but, but I think the important point there is that is about the amount that race as a reaction to some of the it's, it's an amplification in a sense of what's of part of what Stephanie was saying. Race was not only invoked to oppose emancipation projects, but also to account for them not achieving the ends which their proponents had been hoping for. Yes, and I wonder if I could ask whether um, you could speak a bit more about the uh, uh, about Eastern Europe and the, the Russian Empire and uh, in, in, in that context, because it seems to me that, for example, the exclusion of Jews from from the from the land from agricultural labor again. Uh, uh, has is sort of overlaid with with. Uh, anti-Semitism again as a result of a failure of, of social development in that case although of course it's a very different situation it made me think about the relationship between uh, global empires and maritime empires and then these large land-based empires uh, and whether there's a different dynamic going on there. Gosh um, well in my case you're really pushing at the boundaries of my beyond the boundaries of my expertise. What I would say, um, in a sense, is a, is a way of avoiding your question, which is to say that the, the rise of racial anti-Semitism in, cent in Central and Western Europe in the 19th century, as I see it, was very much a response to emancipation. Mm. Um, so to that extent, I would see um, what was going on in Russia as more akin to the sorts of racialization processes of racialization that we were talking about within society, which were not equal societies. I think that what Stephanie said before was really, really important that basically race the ways in which you exclude Jews becomes quite different once you once it becomes some people are imagining societies as composed of equals. Mm. Russia, in that sense, was like the Ancien Regime in Europe. No one imagined people were equal. So all, all, all manner of people had different sorts of privileges and disabilities, and Jews were part of a mosaic there. It, once you have equality, it is different. Yes, I, I can see that. Uh, Stephanie, I wonder if, if you wanted to, to come in on that or uh, the other thing that um, we could look at, at, at now that we've, we've sort, sort of brought up um, Russia is to think about that kind of end of the 19th century moment where, again, thinking about the, the, the period of, of the pogroms in Russia. 
Well, again, it's when David said, gosh, uh, he really spoke my heart because it's not my expertise, but and but and I think he's completely right. I think it's a different situation because of this um, of, of the society and the Tsarist um, regime at that time, and also because of the Jewish communities, which are far bigger. I mean, we do have a Jewish population there in, in the Pale of Settlement, which in part in some smaller towns and villages are majority so and it's like a you know a poor you know land living peddler society pretty bourgeois maybe some of them farmers as well when they were allowed to and and on those programs we see there i think they if you look at if you look at them like you know with this kind of micro history glance they kind of remind very much of pre-modern I wouldn't say medieval. I wouldn't be go so far, but of pre-modern riots against community against Jewish communities, and then of course you have you, they can be exploited by the landlords. They can be exploited by the tsar. But they can be exploited by whoever you know, and and you can push the poor masses against the Jews in order to to you know calm down some some economic unrest. I mean, but this is not this is really something different. I would say. From the social dynamic, then with that, what we see in Western Europe at the same time. Yes, and yet the the, the pogroms, of course, had a, a major knock-on effect in terms of um, Western Europe as well through refugees. Um, and so, I wonder if it might be a good time in the conversation to think about that sort of fin de siècle moment um, and uh, things like the, the the Dreyfus affair in France or the Eulenburg affair in Germany. What was going on there uh, in terms of the development of racial antisemitism? Um, I'm thinking of, uh, uh, you know, anti-Semites like uh, Houston Stuart Chamberlain. Um, how did that accelerate what was happening in terms of racial anti-Semitism? If it did. Uh, David, would you? Okay, uh, I think we need to distinguish at least three things here across Britain, France, Germany, around the fin de siècle. Going back to sort of what I was saying earlier, I think the real issue was emancipation. And so what was driving the debate on was the idea among some figures, chiefly conservative figures, but not only conservative figures, that emancipating the Jews had been a great error because they could never be citizens. They could never be patriots. They were essentially different. And that was the first order issue. Race then became one explanation of this fundamental political problem. But it was not only that. You also then had, it had, um, as we used to say, a relative autonomy. It had, um, there were ideologues of race, such as, such as Chamberlain, who developed the theory. It took on a momentum of its own. And that's very important, obviously, for where this all tragically ends. But the third aspect of this, which is important and, and, and perhaps in some ways more difficult to talk about or difficult to talk about in a different way, is that race was not only something that was done to the Jews. Jews were participants in racial discourse themselves, and they tried to make it work for them in ways which are really very, very interesting. So um, if one reads English Jewish publications from in, in the late 19th century, there, there's a sort of a growing collective consciousness, not always Zionist, rarely Zionist, but a sort of growing collective consciousness among Jews. And they, and some people in respectable publications such as the Jewish Chronicle say, well, of course, the anti-Semites say that this is a problem, but as far as we're concerned, it's not a problem because Racial consciousness is rising all over Europe and it's rising among the Jews as well. There was a sense in which Jew 
Jewish intellectuals, some of them, were trying to make race work for them or to make race work for them as they countered the racists. So for example, Galton's associate, Carl Pearson at University College, just after the First World War, published studies which claimed that um, East European Jewish immigrants in the East End of London, in, in, in school children, had lower IQs. We can now, um, or, or, or were of lower intelligence, he didn't use the term IQ. We can now see how flawed these studies were, but what is notable is that the counter studies which were sponsored by the Jewish Board of Deputies and other Jewish organizations in this country didn't refute the notion of race. Rather, they wanted to say that race, uh, uh, that Jews were, uh, Jews were not a bad race. In fact, Jews were a good race, that Jews were an intelligent race. So race was there in the air, as it were. It was part of the zeitgeist and it was a concept that was used by Jews and by non-Jews. Thank you. Um, so turning again to Stephanie, I, I wonder if you might be able to comment on the ways in which um, Nazi ideology drew on uh, older traditions in racial antisemitism and in what senses um, this was applied, uh, both in terms of um, supporting their idea of insiders in Nazi society, so it, members of the what they called the Volksgemeinschaft, but also in terms of excluding people who they saw as uh, not being um, members of the, the, the Volksgemeinschaft. Yeah, well, yeah, ob obviously most, but I will, I just wanted to, you know, one more remark to add to what David had said, which was, I think, very important that I mean, race as an idea was there in the air, but this does not mean that everyone was an anti-Semite. In fact, in Germany, at least as a political force, anti-Semitism around 1900 was going downhill as a political force. But what spread was a kind of social idea of racial difference, which you know could lead to different and various degrees of race or of hostility or resentment. I mean, I could be a a Protestant uh, bourgeois woman going to concerts and feeling, I don't know, feeling awkward of having Jewish ladies sitting next to me, but I maybe as a liberal, I would not be against any legislation against it. So I think this is important to, to differentiate this, um, this various forms of, of anti-Jewish feelings and so on. But what is new around 90, I mean, around 1900, even before, is two more things, and I mentioned them because they link up with Nazi Germany. One is the nation state idea, who is part of the nation and who is not, and I think this is fundamental. And uh, the other is, and this is not so nice to say, is democracy, of course. I mean, democracy and uh, the, let's say, the social results of, of the capitalist expansion, where you have working class, um, parties being seen as a danger and where you know it's in germany people like stoecker discover that anti-semitism could be a tool in order in a political fight and for majorities and i think this is also an important factor and what and i think so the crucial moment where this is turning for me is not so much 1900 but 1918 after the first world war and the whole crisis and i think this is where we have to start to look at when we want to explain uh, Nazism, because I mean, the Nazis didn't invent anything new. They just took what you know, what what was there and what could be used for their own purposes. And uh, you know, and I mean, Hitler and 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 the NSDAP elite, of course. I mean, I don't have to explain this here. They were anti-Semites, and it, not only this, but anti-Semitism as a conspiracy idea was the core of their worldview. Mm -hmm. Which means, if this is the core. And then this really goes back, and that's why I mentioned the Antichrist <laughs> uh, half an hour ago. If the Jews are the core of all evil, then the idea of destroying them, of fighting them everywhere you find them, or whoever you take as Jewish, you know, is part of this idea. And so, if I mean, it, it would be 
you know, it would take another three hours to explain every step of Nazi policy. But I think even though the Holocaust developed step by step during the war, I think the idea of the Jews being the utmost evil has the idea of murder in a, you know, it's ingrained in it. And when you ask about the Volksgemeinschaft, of course, I mean, uh, it serves for inclusion and exclusion, but I mean, you don't need racial theory for this. You could also be a good Christian, you know, and feel good as a Christian in the 1930s and thinking those Nazis lunatics with their race, racial ideas, but which, you know, you maybe you didn't feel this, you know, you didn't, you felt quite comfortable with Jews being excluded from this Christian German community or from the national German community. So for me, basically anti-Semitism has, the function of anti-Semitism in, in Nazi Germany is a social glue of, you know, gluing all these different layers of society and different interests also together at the same time being a state policy you know, which is different than before, before it was not state policy, being a state policy, which is enforced by state measures like separation, or like, um, again, like the auto da face of older times of public shaming rituals, which we have in 1933, which we have in 1935. So it's put into practice. And, and as this, it also serves as a, how would you put it as a, as a, you know, as an example of what will happen to you if you're not part of this Volksgemeinschaft. Because mm. some people should, still could choose. If you're a communist, you st still had a choice. But if you were like a 14 year old girl or boy and you saw someone being shamed in a race defilement um, public uh, um, you know, manifestation, then you would probably think, well, I do not want to be in this position ever in my life. So the, we have anti-Semitism also as a practice of of, of a dictatorship and, 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 and at the same time, and I think that's why I, I was really, I, I like the, the picture you chose for the invitation. I mean, this graphic, which basically is the best example of the failure of, of racial theory, you know, because their race is your grandfather's and grandmother's religion. And that's what it came down, you know, in the end which means that all these racial theories were like, you know, the Nazis could be very pragmatic when they were dealing with them in politics. Mm. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to, because we're moving towards the hour, I just wanted to turn attention to sort of the, the period after the Holocaust and also as people came to understand outside of uh, uh, continental Europe as well, how people came to understand more about what had happened uh, uh, during the Holocaust. Why did it take uh, some time for racial anti-Semitism to really be seen as um, the central causal factor or being really fundamentally central to Nazi ideology? Uh, either. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not so sure it took so long. I think the survivors knew very well what anti-Semitism meant and how crucial it had been to their to their fate and the fate of their family. So in the early accounts we have, it's so obvious that it's about racial anti-Semitism. And mm. that you and then the first books appear in the 1950s. They I mean they take it for granted in a way. And then only slowly in order to understand the process of how could this happen, at least in Germany, historiography would turn to the state administration, state practice, and not so much towards ideology. And then it took a long, long decades to come back to the importance of racial anti-Semitism. But I think if you look at the first one or two decades, it's there. Yes, I suppose you do have to make the distinction between um, Holocaust memory in Western and Eastern Europe as, as well. Um, but yes, I, I do take your point. Sorry, David. Yeah. I think it was different in Britain, um, one of the, I think one of the most surprising things I've discovered, I discovered doing research on this period was how, how difficult many people in Britain had in describing, in terming the Nazi persecution and genocide. Of course, they didn't have, have that term then, but the Nazi killing of the Jews, the mass murder, as anti-Semitic. And I think there are interesting and complicated reasons for that. 
One reason is that people thought that they knew what anti-Semitism was. They thought they knew that anti-Semitism was about depriving, saying that Jewish emancipation was a bad idea. Anti-Semitism was the Dreyfus affair, or it was publishing the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in, in the Morning Post. This was something quite different. And some people who actually did understand what was going on said, we need to find a different vocabulary to describe this because it is completely unprecedented. And then there were other people who simply didn't understand the specificity or could, or, of Nazi ideology where the Jews were concerned. So you would have the churches who wanted to use the term evil. So the attack on the Jews was on one part of a larger attack on religion. Or you had the left and above all the communists, but not only the communists, who wanted to see it as a part, as a, as, as a, as a degenerate form of capitalist rule and as a, and as a form of totalitarian po persecution. And the, and the attack on the Jews was um, covered under that larger umbrella. So there were some people who didn't name it as anti-Semitic because they were shocked and horrified by what was what they understood was going on. And there were others who didn't name it as such because they didn't understand what was going on. So I'd like to move the discussion to the, towards the present day and ask you both to what extent uh, the historic tropes of racial antisemitism that we've, we've outlined um, are still evident today. Um, and I'd also like to, to reflect on whether there's been a shift in the relationship between um, the way that racial antisemitism works and, and, and manifestations of other forms of racism. Um, so, uh, David, if you if you want to go first, that sure. Um, so, I think that going back to the beginning of where we were, of where we started, few people take racial anti-Semitism seriously now. Yes, there are some nutheads, crackpots out there, but racial anti-Semitism is not a significant political force or even a cultural force. What there is though is racialization. Um, the racialization of the Jews difference is alive and well and it's alive and well among the Jews enemies and their friends. I mean, you know, as, as people very often, I'm not the first, I'm the last of a latest of a long litany of people to say that anti-Semitism and philo-Semitism are two sides of the same coin. And there is an, that's not the whole truth, but there's an element of truth there. So the ascribing of essentialist characteristics to Jews is widespread. And I don't think we are very good at understanding or expressing our understanding of the ways in which Jews are similar and are different, are similar to and different from non-Jews. More broadly, racialization is alive and well in the ways in which we talk about difference in modern society in the West. It's given the rather cozy liberal name of ethnicity. But where we talk about ethnic cultures, we're still mapping cultural traits onto populations. If you like, in classical racial theory, the determination moves from population and biology to culture. With ethnicity, it moves the other way from culture to population. In other words, we have a problem in thinking about similarity and difference. And in parentheses, I would say this should affect the way in which we influence the way in which we approach the past as historians. Because, um, which is not to say that somehow we should absolve people in the past who persecuted Jews, but I think we should look with a bit more charity on people on, in the past who tried to think about similarity and difference. 
because we don't have this solved as an issue for ourselves in the early 21st century. No, we, we, we certainly don't. And, and uh, Stephanie, I wonder, I, I, I introduced your, your book about Trump's America um, uh, uh, at the beginning of the discussion. So I wonder if that might be one of the areas that you might like to comment on. Well, yeah, that's an easy one this time. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I completely agree with, with David on the importance of a kind of culturalized racism, which we have, which is alive and well. And, and at the same time, I think what, for me, what is striking is, and this is in Trump's America, but also in, in I th at least in my country, in Germany, it was the COVID crisis, how really medieval tropes come up again and are alive and well. I mean, this conspiracy theories, you have the hidden power, you have, especially the medical professions, you know? I mean, this is also, we have it in Spain in the 14th century and, and QAnon, I don't know how you pronounce this in English, but you know, this group, which is, you know, uh, kidnapping children in order to get their blood or parts of their book, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this is, in, I mean, if you would have asked me five years ago, if this is possible in a series, I mean, that we really seriously have to deal with this. And this is a, apparently a reason to vote for certain parties. I would have told you, no, we are not going to be that lunatic. So I think this is for me striking and is an, another argument of saying we are, I mean, all these old Christian images are still alive and well with us as well. And I think it's important for our discussion to realize this. And um, I mean, what, what we see now, the, how, how thin the surface is of, you know, of what we call, I mean, what, of, of what are the fundamentals of our societies as, as human rights, democracy, et cetera, et cetera, when we are confronted with a pandemic, with a worldwide crisis. And I think this crisis is not so much about what happens in our countries and our families and whether we can go to a bar or not, but I think the big impact is that it's really worldwide. We, Put on the television and see we see people in India wearing masks and we see them in Chile on the manifestation and we can see them in Finland. So this gives this feeling of there's something going on where there must be a world power behind it in order to be you know responsible for this. And and this is really new in my I mean I can't remember having lived to something like this like as a, as a world and in global moment and and it's uh, it's quite impressive that it comes up. It's very disturbing, yes. So, um, David, do you have any further comments before we turn to the questions from, from the audience? Um, I, I just think neither of us answered your last question quite about anti-Semitism and other racisms in the present moment. And I think um, this isn't an, an original thought, but it is, worth mentioning i think the um the different the broad difference it's not always the case but the broad difference between punching up and punching down and and the imagination of of the anti-semite someone who who feels that he or she is 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 punching up whereas it's it's uh, i in other contexts the imagination is often one of uh, I'm as often one of punching down. Yes, that actually does. It's it's a bit of a coincidence. But our first question from for uh, the audience was: Is there any fundamental difference between anti-Semitism and any other brand of racism? And I think that's probably you've you've outlined the 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 main one. And I, I don't know if Stephanie would have anything to add on on that question. Yeah, I think that's a, that's I think the best and easiest explanation. This, I mean, I always put it like the anti-Semite looks, you know, up behind him once, somebody is behind him and above him doing evil things and the racist looks down. But of course, historically and theoretically and even on present day, we have entanglements, you know. I would also stress, as I do all the time, the, the religious impact, of course, but, you know, as I mentioned before, what happened to the Jews in Spain happened to the Muslims as well. In, in Spain at that time. So anti-Semitism has been in, men, in some aspects in my eyes unique and at the same time enormously able to entangle with other forms of hatred. Mm -hmm. This can be you know, racism, homophobic, whatever. And this is what we see today as well. Mm -hmm. um, so 
So we have a question from Anushka Alexander Rose, who says, I'd be interested to hear how racial antisemitism fits into contemporary discussions around uh, white privilege uh, in relation to uh, white presenting Caucasian, mostly Ashkenazi Jews, and where Safadi, Misrahi, Jews of color fit into the discussion. So I don't know which of you might want to take that one on. Um, well, I have a, it's not, it's not quite perhaps what the questioner had in mind, but I think that um, the very term anti-Semitism for some people of color speaks of white privilege. And, and, I've, and, and I've been told this very, um, and I've been told this bracingly. Um, so uh, the argument would run, um, you, um, it was in, in the context of the United States that it was given to me. Someone said to me, well, look, in the United States, we have anti-Japanese racism, we have anti-Black racism, we have anti-Chicano racism. Why don't you just call it anti semitism Why don't you just call it anti-Jewish racism? But you call it anti-Semitism. And that, she said, for her friends, was a way of Jews claiming white privilege by claiming a special name for the racism that they um, encounter. Um, I, I gave her a, a, an historical account of the way in which the term anti-Semitism emerged. It actually wasn't, it was invented by the Jews' enemies, not by the Jews themselves, and then adopted as a way to, um, in, in which Jews and their friends described and denoted the enemies of the Jews. So it, it's not an unanswerable point, but that is one, as I say, bracing way in which um, anti-Semitism intersects with the, with, with uh, the, the um, politics and accusations of white privilege. Mm. Well, and one might, I only would like to add that on, on the other hand, it took a long time for the Jews to become white in the United States and elsewhere. I mean, this is also an important, um, you know, one has to keep this in mind as well, yeah. There's quite a few questions, so apologies for, for moving the discussion on. Yeah. I have a question of uh, whether growing uh, racial uh, consciousness uh, is a response to being othered uh, fundamentally. I, I, I'm sort of struggling to quite get uh, the, the the nuances of the question, but I, is the growing racial is growing racial consciousness a response to being othered in the first place? Is the question? Well, I think if I can answer that, because I think I noticed when that came up, and I think it was in response to me talking about Jews appropriating the language of race for themselves. And I think all I'd say is that yes, um, I don't think that's the whole story, but it's certainly a part of the story, and. Um, um, it was a response to, um, it, it, it was using the language of race and racial theory, as it were, as a way of defending Jews against their enemies, certainly. Mm. Okay, I have a question. Um, what can we learn from the study of anti-Semitism that could help us understand other forms of racism? Everything. Read our books, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Of course, I think I think exactly what we are trying, you know, to say the 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 difference and the similarities. And in order to to see the differences, and again, I insist on this. Maybe I'm a bit monothematic, but I think there is a difference beca because of this base, you know, fundamental competition of the two and then three monotheistic religions, which have a different role, and the Jews have a very special and specific role as being the first one. And, and then having to deal in history with, uh, with their little brothers who hate them and want to take their position, to put it simple. But then by, you know, along, you know, throughout the centuries, this othering and the forms it took and the means that, you know, it, that were used, of course, as I said, they were, have always been entangled. And, and so, and, and also the reactions, as, as David already said. But he wants to add something. I can see that. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I agree with what Stephanie says, and Stephanie is absolutely right to remind us of the particular role of Jews and Judaism 
in Christian and post-Christian culture. Um, uh, but that shouldn't lead us, and also what Stephanie said about the entangled nature of racism. But the particularity of the Jews' place in Christian culture shouldn't lead us to think um, that anti-Semitism is different and somehow all the other racisms can be put in one in one box. I don't think that Stephanie was arguing for that at all, but it, I, I just thought it, it's important to underline that, that different racisms employ, employ different narratives, different stereotypes. However, what unites them at an ethical and political level is that they're all wrong for the same reason. If you like, that's what is the a uniting glue when we talk about racisms as one and as one family, if you like. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. I'm afraid we have now come to the end of our time. Um, so uh, before I say thank you to the speakers, which I certainly will do for a fascinating discussion, I just wanted to mention that there will be one more event in this series, which will look at the theme of colonial violence in British historical memory. This isn't yet listed on our website, but we hope it will be soon. And this will take place in uh, either mid-December or early January. Um, but I, I think it's safe to say that this uh, discussion this evening has been a, a, an excellent addition to the series and has um, continued it. Uh, it's, it's trend so far of being thought provoking um, and, um, and, and important in, in, in the society that we're living in today where we face so many grave problems around racism. So I would like to finish by uh, saying a huge thank you to Professor David Feldman and to Professor Stephanie Shula Springorum for, uh, for speaking tonight. And also I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for joining us. Thank you very much and good evening everybody. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs>